Welcome to part 21 of the Ultimate Unsolved Mysteries Iceberg. In this series, we deep dive cases including true crime, mysterious disappearances, myths and legends, strange events, internet mysteries, and more. The Disappearance of K. Alana Turner. This is a recommendation from community member Scarlett Weaver. Thanks for bringing K. Alana's case to my attention. This one seems like it could have a positive resolution. In the early hours of March 10, 2023, the community of Tomball, Texas was shaken by the disappearance of Kay Alana Turner, a 28-year-old woman. The circumstances surrounding Kay Alana's disappearance are as puzzling as they are distressing. Kay Alana had recently undergone a change in her PTSD medication which her family speculates could have led to a manic episode, explaining her unusual behavior. On the day she vanished, Kay Alana reportedly drove towards deputies while attempting to flee them. She sped off through pasture land and destroyed fences. After she crashed her vehicle, she exited it barefoot, leaving behind her phone, purse, and other personal belongings. She then fled on foot into the woods. It is believed she crossed Spring Creek into Montgomery County, Texas on foot. Unfortunately, despite suffering a mental health crisis, she was initially listed as a fugitive due to felony warrants issued for evading in a motor vehicle and aggravated assault on a police officer. Once the situation was rectified, Kay Alana was later placed on Harris County's official missing person list on March 24th, 2023. It appears that she is still facing the felony charges. However, the authorities are now aware of the reason she took her actions. Given the circumstances, I suspect that Kay Alana has decided to lay low and is living with friends, or is perhaps living on the street. It's also possible that she fled Texas entirely and is now living in another state. At any rate, I believe this case has a high probability of a positive outcome, with Kay Alana returning home safely. At present, if you have any information with respect to this case, please reach out to the Harris County Sheriff's Office or Crime Stoppers of Houston, Texas. The 1991 Austin Yogurt Shop Slayings. This intriguing and horrific case was recommended by YouTube member Infinite Lemniscata. On December 6, 1991, a devastating event shook Austin, Texas. The local, I can't believe it's yogurt, shop became the scene of a horrendous incident where four teenage girls, Eliza Thomas, Jennifer Harbison, Sarah Harbison, and Amy Ayers were found in tragic circumstances following a reported fire. The authorities discovered the victims had been bound with signs indicating they had been subjected to unspeakable acts. Eyewitnesses reported two suspicious looking men in the shop prior to the store closing. Initial suspicion fell on four local teenagers, Maurice Pierce, Forrest Wellborn, Michael Scott, and Robert Springsteen. Subsequent confessions from Scott and Springsteen led to their convictions. However, these were later overturned due to procedural violations. Moreover, advanced DNA testing brought additional twists, revealing profiles that did not match any of the accused. In an unusual twist, Maurice Pierce, one of the initial suspects, was killed in an altercation with police in 2010. At first glance, you might think there is a conspiracy angle here. However, Pierce was slain by police in response to his stabbing an officer in the neck with a knife. Talk about nominative determinism, right? Theories around the case have proliferated over the years, with over 1,000 individuals considered as potential suspects. Among them was Kenneth McDuff, a known serial killer in the area at the time. However, he was quickly ruled out due to a lack of substantial evidence connecting him to the event. Further, this case saw a significant number of false confessions, with Austin police advising that they have received upwards of 50 reported confessions to the slayings. If you have any information with respect to this heinous act, please contact the Austin Police Department with details. 
the slaying of Dana Bradley. This case was recommended by Discord community member Marsh. Remember the LCZ Discord server is a great place to connect with other members of the community and make suggestions. Click the link in the video description to join. Dana Bradley, a 14-year-old from St. John's, Newfoundland and Labrador in Canada, disappeared on December 14, 1981, while hitchhiking on Topsail Road in St. John's. After visiting a friend, she was on her way home for a family birthday party but never arrived. A witness reported seeing her getting into a car with a male driver who had presumably picked her up in the course of her hitchhiking. Her body was discovered four days later in a wooded area on Maddox Cove Road, south of the city. She had suffered blunt force trauma and other injuries, and her body was laid out with her school books tucked under her arm. The investigation into her case became one of the most exhaustive in Canadian history. Early on, more than 800 cars were examined, and the case saw a mix of the Royal Canadian Mounted Police, RCMP, and the Royal Newfoundland Constabulary, involving 35 full-time investigators. Despite extensive efforts, including a false confession in 1986 by David Grant Somerton, which was later recanted, it has remained unsolved. In May 2016, the case saw renewed interest with the excavation of two vehicles believed connected to Bradley's case, based on the testimony of an alleged eyewitness. No conclusive evidence was found due to the vehicle's condition and contamination. Simultaneously, new DNA evidence emerged that pointed to an unknown male, but did not lead to a resolution. However, in a small break in the case, this DNA evidence was significant enough to clear some suspects previously linked to the case. 40 years after Bradley's disappearance, there is still hope that new technology, particularly advancements in DNA science, might finally lead to solving the case. An ancestry company, Jed Match, which specializes in cold cases, offered their services emphasizing the potential of genetic genealogy in resolving such long-standing mysteries. Notably, a number of long-standing cold cases have been resolved using this methodology. As of 2024, genetic genealogy has provided a link to a new, completely unknown person. I hope to have a positive development in this mystery at some point in the future. Dana's family deserves the closure, and the killer needs to be brought to justice. If you have any information regarding this case, please contact the RCMP or Royal Newfoundland Constabulary. Stellar's Sea Ape Stellar's Sea Ape, a cryptid reportedly observed by the renowned German zoologist Georg Steller in 1741, remains a curious figure in the realm of cryptozoology. The creature was sighted near the Shumigan Islands in Alaska, displaying unique physical and behavioral characteristics. Steller described it as approximately 1.8 meters long, with a dog-like head, pointed ears, large eyes, and distinctive whiskers. Its body was described as long and rotund, tapering towards the tail, with a thick fur coat that was gray on the back and reddish-white on the belly. Interestingly, Steller did not observe any forelimbs or pectoral fins on the creature, and it possessed a tail with two fins, the upper fin being double the size of the lower, akin to a shark's tail fins. The sea ape exhibited playful and curious behavior. Steller recounted an instance where the animal interacted with a large seaweed stalk, displaying what he described as juggling tricks, much like a trained monkey. However, when Steller attempted to capture the creature by firing at it, he missed, and the creature disappeared, only to return briefly before disappearing again. This would be the last time the sea ape was seen by Steller. Interestingly, there was another alleged sighting in June 1965 by sailor Miles Smeaton, along with his daughter and a friend near the northern coast of Atka Island. They described a creature matching Stellar's description in size, fur color, and facial features. 
noting the encounter lasted for about 10 to 15 seconds. Smeaton's account closely matched Stellar's observations. However, the veracity of Stellar's sea ape's existence has been a subject of debate. Critics argue that the circumstances of Stellar's northern expedition, characterized by isolation, disease, and desperation, could have influenced Stellar's perception. This could have led him to misidentify known animals such as fur seals or otters as something more fantastical. Some theorize that the physical and behavioral traits described could match those of the northern fur seal especially considering the playful nature and physical features. Notably, Stellar made his account before he had ever encountered a fur seal, which may explain the misidentification. Also, as an aside, the sea ape title is thought to be more indicative of the creature's behavior rather than its physical resemblance to a primate. Over the years, various theories have surfaced attempting to explain the creature's origins including misidentifications of known species, or perhaps an undiscovered animal. However, no conclusive evidence has been presented to confirm the existence of Stellar's sea ape. The possibility that Stellar's sea ape represents a rare, now extinct seal species has gained traction among scholars. Stellar, a credible naturalist, might have encountered an undocumented species exhibiting unique traits. Further, Stellar identified many real established species, such as the now extinct Stellar's sea cow, the Paraquat slayings. In 1985, Japan experienced a harrowing series of indiscriminate poisonings that shocked the nation and remains unsolved. The events unfolded primarily around vending machines across western and central Japan, where unsuspecting individuals purchased beverages laced with a deadly herbicide, Paraquat dichloride. The substance is extremely toxic and can lead to severe or fatal health complications within hours to days of ingestion. The first incident was recorded on April 30th, when a 45-year-old truck driver in Fukuyama Hiroshima consumed a vitamin-enriched drink, Oronaman C, that was left atop a vending machine. He became extremely ill and as a result succumbed to the poisoning by May 30, 1985. This marked the beginning of a series of tragic events that would lead to at least 12 fatalities and 35 severe poisonings. The drinks involved in these incidents were primarily Oronaman C, and real gold, drinks that were popular at the time. The poisoning seemed to exploit a promotional strategy by Otsuka Pharmaceutical, the manufacturer of Oronamin C, which involved a buy one, get one deal. This led consumers to think they had stumbled upon an unpaid promotional item when they found these laced beverages. The victims ranged in age and background, and there was no apparent connection between them adding to the mystery and randomness of the attacks. The incidents led to widespread fear and confusion, with a 17-year-old girl from Saitama being one of the last known victims before the incidents mysteriously ceased. The response from authorities and companies was multifaceted. Warning labels and leaflets were posted around vending machines across Japan. Further, the National Police Agency initiated a nationwide campaign to educate the public on how to inspect beverages from vending machines. Despite these efforts, the investigation reached a dead end with no significant leads, evidence, or motive uncovered, leaving the case unsolved to this day. The aftermath of these incidents saw a change in public behavior and a re-evaluation of product safety and consumer trust. Nearly four decades have passed since the incidents, and the statute of limitations for such acts was abolished in Japan in 2010. However, the law does not apply retroactively, and as such, the person or persons responsible for this act are free to confess to this crime today with no consequences. The Paraquat incidents remain one of the most disturbing and baffling chapters in Japanese criminal history. 
My theory is that the incident may have been a disturbing attempt at extortion. Considering the nature of the crimes, where beverages were tampered with and left in public spaces, one might consider the possibility of an intended extortion scheme gone awry. In typical product tampering cases aiming for extortion, the perpetrator usually threatens to harm the public or continue their actions unless a ransom is paid. If you're a longtime follower of this series, you'll remember that in episode 3 I covered the monster with 21 faces case, which covered similar circumstances also in Japan. However, in this case, no public demands or threats were made known, which diverges from the conventional extortion template. It's plausible to speculate that the initial intention could have been to create a climate of fear, subsequently leading to an extortion attempt that never materialized. This theory is supported by the random and widespread nature of the incidents, which would be effective in garnering significant public attention and panic, setting the stage for a high-stakes extortion demand. The lack of evidence makes the extortion theory difficult to substantiate and as the investigations yielded no suspects, this really is speculative. However, it's theoretically possible that extortion money was paid behind the scenes, explaining the sudden stop in the poisonings. Jimmy here, the YouTuber behind the Lazy Chill Zone channel. If you're enjoying my content, please hit the like and subscribe buttons and the notification bell. My goal is to create the most expansive iceberg series in YouTube history, but I need your subscription to do it. Remember to consider signing up for a YouTube membership, joining the Patreon, and joining the Discord. In particular, YouTube memberships and Patreon support allows for me to create videos which risk demonetization. The U-530 Mystery. The mysterious surrender of U-530, a German submarine, remains one of the enduring puzzles of World War II's aftermath. Commissioned in October 1942 and manned by 48 crew members, U-530 was involved in several patrols, sinking two ships and damaging another during its wartime service. Its journey ended not in the immediate aftermath of Germany's surrender, but in a delayed, secretive arrival at Mar del Plata, Argentina, on July 10, 1945. Throughout the war, U-boats were critical to Germany's naval strategy, particularly during the Battle of the Atlantic. U-boats, not specified or blocked under the Treaty of Versailles restrictions, thus became a significant tool against Allied forces. They were infamous for their stealth and deadly efficiency, carrying torpedoes and deck guns for surface engagements. By the war's end, they had sunk numerous Allied vessels, contributing significantly to the wartime maritime peril. U-530's seventh and final patrol took it dangerously close to New York, aiming for Allied convoys without success. As the war concluded, Admiral Carl Donitz ordered all U-boats to surrender effective immediately. However, U-530 did not comply immediately with these orders. Instead, it set a course for Argentina discarding its torpedoes, deck guns, documents, and ship's log en route, actions shrouded in secrecy and prompting speculation. The crew arrived with no personal identification, deepening the mystery surrounding their mission and the delay in their surrender. Upon reaching Argentina, U-530's unexpected appearance ignited a flurry of rumors and conspiracy theories. These theories range from clandestine operations to the ferrying of high-ranking Nazi officials or treasure to South America. Despite extensive investigations and speculation, no concrete evidence has substantiated these theories. The submarine and its crew's motives for the unusual surrender remain a topic of debate and inquiry. Following its surrender, U-530's crew was interned and eventually repatriated while the submarine itself was later used for target practice and sunk. The context of U-530's surrender is further compounded by the presence of another U-boat, U-977, which surrendered a month later, also in Argentina. 
This added to the speculation regarding the late surrenders, suggesting a coordinated effort or mission among these U-boats beyond mere escape from potential Allied retribution. Despite numerous investigations and the passage of time, the reasons behind U-530's actions and its delayed surrender remain unresolved. One popular theory ties U-530 into conspiracies surrounding New Swabia. The connection between U-530 and New Swabia, a territory claimed by Germany and Antarctica, originates from speculative theories rather than documented historical facts. There are theories that suggest U-530 was involved in transporting leaders or treasures to an Antarctic base. Alternative theories go even further and suggest that German UFOs were moved by this submarine to Antarctica, which were then transported into the hollow core of Earth. When did the dodo go extinct? The dodo, an extinct species of flightless bird, was native to Mauritius, an island in the Indian Ocean. This bird, larger than a turkey and weighing over 40 pounds, had blue-gray feathers, a large head and beak, and small wings of questionable value. The absence of natural predators on Mauritius led to the dodo's inability to fly, with adaptations making them ground-nesting birds. However, this lack of fear towards predators would contribute to their downfall following human arrival. The common portrayal of the dodo as fat, slow, and clumsy is debated, with some suggesting this image may have been skewed by explorers' perspectives. It's hypothesized that the birds were not inherently overweight and sluggish, but may have appeared so due to being overfed or misinterpreted by the sailors and settlers who documented them. The dodo's initial discovery by European explorers is dated back to around 1598 with the Dutch East India Company's sailors being among the first to document these creatures. The island's isolation had kept the dodo shielded from human contact until then, leading to a lack of fear towards humans and making them easy prey. This fearlessness, combined with the inability to fly, made dodos easy targets for sailors and the animals they introduced, such as feral pigs, dogs, and rats. These invasive species competed with dodos for food, destroyed their nests, and consumed their eggs, significantly contributing to their decline. The exact date of the dodo's extinction is debated among scholars. The last widely recognized sighting of a live dodo was in 1662, yet there are records indicating possible later sightings. Nonetheless, the consensus remains that the dodo became extinct in the late 17th century, less than a century after its discovery by Europeans. The exact reason for their decline is unknown, given poor record keeping at the time. However, this rapid decline is generally attributed to a combination of a number of factors. These factors include direct hunting by humans, habitat destruction, and the introduction of non-native species that preyed on dodos and their offspring. Notably, recent studies have suggested that the dodo could have persisted into the 18th century, potentially making the dodo much more resilient than previously thought. The Grassman. The Ohio Grassman, also known as the Eastern Bigfoot, is a creature that has intrigued Ohioans and cryptid enthusiasts for over 150 years. First reported in 1869, the Grassman is described as a large, hairy, bipedal entity standing up to nine feet tall. Unlike the solitary Bigfoot, the Grassman is noted for its social behaviors, often seen in groups, and even mothers with their young have been reported. This cryptid distinguishes itself from other hominid-type cryptids through its diet, primarily consuming tall grasses like wheat which are abundant in Ohio's farmland. One of the most notable encounters occurred in 1978 with the Clayton family, who reported multiple visits from this creature at their home near a gravel pit. The family described it as a dark-haired being around seven feet tall and 300 pounds. The creature is alleged to have slain the family German Shepherd, though there's no proof that this occurred. 
The Grassman is still occasionally reported, however with much less frequency than in the 20th century. Personally, I would imagine that most Grassman sightings are just written off as Bigfoot sightings these days, but perhaps the folklore in Ohio is strong enough to override this. Sanikov Land Sanikov Land, a phantom island believed to be located in the Arctic Ocean, has intrigued explorers and geographers since the early 19th century. The island's story began when Russian merchant and explorer Yakov Sanikov first reported its existence in 1811 during an expedition to the New Siberian Islands. He described spotting a new land north of Kotelny Island, which led to the naming of Sanikov Land. The allure of Sanikov Land captivated many subsequent explorers, including the Baltic German explorer Eduard von Toll. Toll claimed to have observed the land in 1886 during another expedition to the New Siberian Islands. Despite repeated attempts, including a dramatic 1901 effort that ended with Toll and his team vanishing, the existence of Sanikov land remained unverified. The island was mapped and included in geographical records up until the first half of the 20th century. However, extensive searches yielded no physical evidence of its existence. Scientists eventually disproved the existence of Sanikov land suggesting it could be compared to other imaginary islands which lingered on maps after being disproved. Despite its ultimate categorization as a phantom island, some theorists speculate that Sanikov land might have been real at some point. According to this theory, it was possibly formed from fossilized ice or permafrost, only to be destroyed by coastal erosion or other natural phenomena. However, this theory, like the island itself, remains speculative and not widely accepted among the scientific community. The Barmanu. The Barmanu is an ape cryptid reported to inhabit the mountainous regions of northern Pakistan, including Chitral and the Karakoram Ranges. It is reported to be a bipedal humanoid primate similar to the much more well-known Bigfoot or Yeti. It's said to possess both human and ape-like characteristics, with some accounts suggesting it wears animal skins and has a penchant for abducting women. The creature's habitat, lying between the Pamirs and the Himalayas, places it in proximity to the territories of other Bigfoot cousins, like the Almas of Central Asia and the Yeti. The Barmanu came to broader attention through the work of Spanish zoologist Jordi Magraner who conducted extensive field research in the area from the late 1980s to the 1990s. His efforts culminated in the collection of numerous accounts of encounters with the creature. His research, however, was tragically cut short by his slaying in Afghanistan in 2002. Comparatively, the Barmanu and Bigfoot share several key characteristics, including their bipedal stance, reported human-like behaviors, and elusive nature. However, some suggest that the Barmanu is perhaps a close human cousin rather than a Bigfoot variant, as there are numerous reports of them kidnapping women. At any rate, given the geopolitical reality of where this creature is sighted, I doubt we will have any significant developments about this cryptid anytime soon. The disappearance of Master Philip, the mission of Master Philip to find Prester John, represents a fascinating chapter in the history of medieval explorations, shaped by a blend of myth, religion, and the quest for allies in the Crusades. Prester John, a legendary Christian ruler, purported to rule a vast kingdom in the East, captivated the European imagination with tales of wealth, power, and piety. This enigmatic figure was thought to be a potential ally against the Islamic world, which at the time was seen as a significant threat to Christendom. In 1177, in an effort to reach out to this mysterious Christian monarch, Pope Alexander III dispatched his physician, Master Philip, with a letter addressed to Prester John. This mission was motivated by a combination of spiritual zeal and the strategic need to find an ally against the growing Muslim powers. 
However, the mission of Master Philip is shrouded in mystery. There are no concrete records detailing his journey or its outcome. It is widely believed that Master Philip never returned, and no direct communication with the legendary Prester John was established. I note that given Prester John's legendary status, it would have been impossible to complete this mission as assigned. I suspect there is a significant chance that Master Philip, given a significant sum of wealth and gifts for expenses on the journey, and as a gift to Prester John, absconded with the wealth or was slain. Given that the journey was long and arduous, as well as nebulous, there would have been little to prevent Master Philip from divvying the booty up amongst his traveling party. In the alternative, given the long and uncertain trip, his traveling party may have simply ended him and split the loot between themselves. Make sure to like, subscribe, and hit that notification bell. Also check out the Patreon and the YouTube membership. Your support allows me to take on more difficult topics that risk demonetization. Remember to hit the playlist to see dozens of hours of Unsolved Mysteries content. Huge thanks to all my YouTube members and patrons. Shout out to my patrons Noah Schubert, Kazak Cutie, Kurt the Squirt, Monoxide Wendigo, Jeffer Metcalf, and Z Volts. Also, big shout out to YouTube member Jordan All and Syntax Nexus. Until next time, stay safe and healthy. Peace out, everyone.